It's my pleasure to welcome Alina Marion from Northeastern University, who will talk to us today about on the tautological cohomology of the moduli space of curves. Thanks for introducing me and thanks for inviting me. Well, so um, the main object of study today is um, uh, MG. This is a moduli space of smooth projective curves of genus G. I look at this over the complex numbers. And so we're also going to look at um, MG1. So this parametrizes curves together with a point. And there's a map from mg1 to mg, which just forgets the point. We're going to refer to this map as pi. And so I'll also refer to this mg1 as the, as the universal curve over mg. Okay, so in fact, I will most of the time call it c. Okay. So now we, we want to talk about cohomology classes on, on mg. So um, the way we're gonna the way we're gonna generate them is to consider um, what we're gonna consider on on the universal curve the uh, the first Chern class of the relative dualizing sheaf. So and I'm gonna denote that as psi. So this is C1 of relative cotangent sheaf here. Okay. And we're going to uh, push forward powers of this, powers of this class uh, via pi to mg. And this is what uh, gives us the kappa class. It's first, first introduced by Mumford. So by definition, this is the uh, pi push forward of the i plus first power of psi. Um, so these were introduced by Mumford in an algebraic context. and by Morita in a topological context. So we're going to view these, these, one can view either in the cohomology ring of mg, let's say with, with q coefficients, but um, I, I will mostly look at them as, uh, as lying in the, in the algebraic ring, in the Chow ring of mg. Okay. So, um, so yeah, although, although I, you know, the word cohomology was in the title of this talk, I will mostly actually uh, uh, talk about the, 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 chowering of, uh, the chowering of MG. So, um, so the, 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 the tautological ring of MG we're going to denote it as R star of mg, and this is the Q subalgebra of of the Chow of the Chow ring generated by the kappa classes. Okay, I should. Cohomology is just the Russian cohomology of the mapping class. Yeah, that's correct. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. I won't take that perspective though in this talk, but that's true. That's correct. Um, well, so another actually another geometric object of interest to us is um, obtained by just pushing forward omega, the cotangent uh, sheaf, and what we get here is uh, on MG is the so-called Hodge bundle. And so here, the fiber over uh, a curve uh, of genus G is simply the space of holomorphic one forms on C. Okay. So this is so this is a rank G bundle on MG. Okay. 
So I'll just start by uh, listing, so the histo histological ring upon its introduction by Mumford has, has been studied intensely um, for, for two reasons. First of all, because it seems to capture a lot of the geometry of MG that is of interest to us. And second, because the, the entire cohomology or the chow of, of MG is not really accessible. It's not, we can't really get our hands on it. So then we study we sort of restrict attention to this ring that we have a hope to understand. Um, so let me, let me just list a few properties of, of it. So that have been sort of slowly established. Um, but number one, well, so for low genus, the tautological ring actually coincides with the chow ring. This is true for genus at most five. In general, however, the inclusion is proper of the tautological ring in the full chow ring of Mg. Well, secondly, it's a result of Mumford that the first G minus two uh, kappa classes uh, generate the, the tautological ring. Okay. So Mumford, in order to deduce this, he considered the following geometric construction on the universal curve. Uh, so this is, so you know, in order to in order to prove this, of course, he had to find relations among these kappa classes, and so um, he he did so by considering a geometric construction on the universal curve. And it all starts with a very basic observation that for a fixed curve, the space of sections of the canonical bundle generate the canonical bundle. So you've got a surjective map. Okay? So then if you if you if you if you think about this over the moduli space of curves, what one gets is that um, the pullback of the Hodge bundle to the universal curve surjects onto um, onto omega, the relative dualizing sheet. So this is on C. And so then the kernel is locally free. So the kernel, let's call it K, is locally free, and it's a um, it's a it's a vector it's it's a vector bundle of rank G minus one. The Hodge bundle has rank Gs, and this this is obviously a rank one uh, sheaf. So it has <coughs> rank G minus one. So then Mumford's relations which help establish that result just come from the fact that imposing the condition that as this is a rank G, rank G minus one bundle, its churn classes vanish past the rank. So if you are imposing that the churn classes of this kernel bundle vanish for i greater than or equal to G, and then you push forward you push forward these from the universal curve via pi to mg. Well, you you know in the end you, you play with it and one, one 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 obtains this result. Okay, so it's sort of a very very simple geometric fact it yields this these relations among the kappa classes. Also, well, let's um, continue. So <laughs> so this so I'm presenting this in some in more or less in chronological order. Um, so the next big result, which is due to Loyenga, is that in fact the tautological ring is zero in uh, in degrees past g minus one, past g minus one, g minus two. I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry. So for i greater than or equal to. Uh, greater than g minus two, and it's at most one-dimensional in degree g minus two. Um, okay, so sort of a very very clear result. And then um, slightly later, Karl Faber strengthened it and showed, in fact, that in degree g minus two, 
mg is in fact one dimensional and is generated by the kappa plus kg minus 2. Okay. I think so. Okay, so this and another another remarkable fact established independently in an algebraic setting by Yonel and a topological setting by, by Morita is the fact that the first G over three um, kappa classes in fact generate the ring. So kappa one to kappa G over three generate R star, and moreover, there are no relations among these classes. Which, which uh, established the conjecture of Faber. Okay. Had been, this had been a conjecture of Faber. So this was proved in the... Uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, this fourth result by uh, Yonel and Morita. So I guess Yonel uh, proved, proved it in the, in the setting of the, of the Chow ring and Morita in the setting of cohomology. So, um, yeah, maybe... I should, um, yeah, I should also say that, uh, which is, is not quite, it's sort of deviating a bit from the main uh, object of the, uh, of the talk, but uh, I should say that there is a, as far as the cohomology of MG, there's a stable range. Um, so, so, you know, if you look at uh, cohomology, this is a, a result of Harder. If you look at cohomology in degree K, is going to be equal to the cohomology in degree k of mg plus 1, starting with a certain genus. And this is uh, roughly 3k over 2, something like that. So then one can define, so one can define a, um, the stable, the stable cohomology of, M, of mg. And the result here, the, the big result here, so I will refer to it as m, a star of m, q, is that this is isomorphic to the polynomial ring in the kappa classes. Okay. So, um, what's still outstanding as far as, uh, as far as results about the cohomology of the chowering of MG is, is um, also a conjecture of Faber uh, dating from the early 90s, which says that um, if we're looking at the, at the pairing in the chowering uh, between um, complementary classes, Oh, oh, sorry. I'm just wondering. I, mean, no, no, I just no, want to I make don't. sure you're not leaving out something you meant to state. Okay, no, thanks. Okay. So, yeah, maybe I should say six. No, I don't think I'm leaving out. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Do you think you're the only one who noted? And this, just one more comment then. So, this, uh, yeah. this stabilization theorem of her, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's only rational, right? I mean, the internet yeah. homology is the denominator of this. Oh. Um. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. No, this is rational. I can't, yeah, I wouldn't say, yeah, over Z, I, yeah, I don't know what, what goes on, yeah. Yeah, so th this is definitely rational. So everything in this talk is rational, either rational chow or rational cohomology. Uh, well, so there's just uh, the usual uh, intersection product here, um, which sends, which sends complementary classes into a, a class of degree um, g minus 2. And then we've seen that this is, by the result of uh, Faber, this is isomorphic to Q. And if one fixes this isomorphism, 
then the uh, Faber conjecture says that this is a perfect pairing. Okay. Or in other words, the, the way this is usually stated is that our star of mg is Gorenstein. It's a Gorenstein ring with Sokol in dimension g minus 2. No, there are no relations. But then it can't be an Artinian Gernstein ring. Right? Um, I'm just confused. So well, I mean, these are classes in different degrees. Yeah. No, so I mean, yeah, I mean, there are no. It's only in particular. Like, Apple 1 to some power is 0. Oh, oh, okay. What? Sorry? Apple 1 to some power is 0. Well, that's a relation. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, that, that, that was oh. the sort of nature of the complaint. Oh, I see, I see. Well, there are no relations among them in, you know, in, in this, in up, up to this degree. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. Well, everything to the power g minus 2 is there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This means that uh, this MG is a rational Poincare duality space? Yeah, exactly. So this is exactly what it says. It, it says that our star of MG is really, is really like uh, uh, the, you know, the cohomology ring um, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a smooth projective variety. So the, rather the ring generated by the algebraic classes in the cohomology ring of a smooth projective variety. Um, So, moreover, the conjecture is even more elaborate. I mean, it says that, you know, for instance, uh, um, uh, this R star of MG enjoys the hard left sheds property with respect to kappa 1, which is, a, which is an ample class. Okay, so it's just uh, it's more structure, conjecturally. In fact, you know, so Faber had a sort of a set of conjectures that were supposed to really capture the structure of this uh, tautological cohomology, and um, they've sort of been knocked out one by one. This was part of it, um, but uh, but this this is still, which is the most interesting part, is still outstanding. Okay. What's the motivation for these conjectures? Oh, rather empirical, you know. So uh, so he really calculated in, in low genus. So in low genera, you know, just you, you play you play with these rings in low genera. And how do you calculate I mean how do you do a calculation? Like well, well I mean he has an elaborate code, okay. you know, that sort of processes relations. But the question is how do you so our next question, in fact we're we're gonna be busy with this for the rest of the talk, is how do you generate relations among these kappa classes really? So is that kind of a geometric conjecture about what yeah, this is often asked. This is this is often asked, and, and nobody knows. You know, is there actually some sort of um, projective uh, projective sub variety of MG of dimension G minus two? So so yeah, this is this is not known. This is not uh, well. There you know, there's a bound for the for the dimension of a um, of a uh, of a complete sub variety of MG. Uh, and this is, uh, you, you cannot have any past dimension g minus 2. But g minus 2 is actually not excluded, so, but, yeah, I mean, uh, so, yeah, well, it's a natural question. Um, so the question is how to generate relations between kappa classes. So we're going to start here with, uh, uh, I guess, with F Faber's uh, original method for, 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 for producing relations. And so, 
we, we, in fact, we already saw one such construction. This was the Mumford construction. Um, and so everything else that people, people write down sort of um, you know, you take it take it to take it to a further level. So, but the basic idea is always the same. Um, and this idea is that you want to consider some geometric space naturally sitting over MG, where you have some really geometric, geometrically trivial identity staring staring you, and you just push forward that to MG. That's it's it's always the same the same game. So, uh, for the Mumford relations, we saw that. Uh, Again, it's sort of the vanishing of the Chern classes of a vector bundle past its rank, so it's a triviality in whatever space you consider that. But you push forward to this to mg, and you calculate among kappa classes, you get some complicated equations among these kappa classes. So, so here is a, so I'll just get, go over a few uh, a few methods for constructing such relations. So, um, so number one, it, this is this is Faber's. Um, method is, so what he did consider is the deep symmetric product, let's say, symmetric products of the, of the universal curve sitting over mg. Okay, so this parametrizes um, curves together with effective divisors of degree d on c. So, um, so in particular, there's a universal sequence. So we've got a uh, universal sequence um, on, uh, let's call it like this, on, uh, on the symmetric product cross the universal curve over mg. And so the property of this is that if we, if we specialize to, if we restrict to a curve and a divisor, what we get is a tautological sequence of this divisor. So restricted to this, this is just uh, the inclusion of O minus D into O. So, quotient. So this, is, this is, has rank 1. It's, it's a line bundle. Q is, a, is some torsion sheaf. So, so here the basic observation is that, well, if I'm, if we're looking on a on a fixed curve, if uh, the degree is sufficiently high, of course um, the the line bundle O of D just doesn't have higher cohomology. Yeah. So O of D, H one of O of D would be zero for degrees uh, greater than or equal to two G minus one. Which means that so O of D is, is the dual, comes from the dual of this universal, uh, universal line bundle. So this means that if we push forward this um, S dual to, uh, to, um, to just the symmetric product, uh, we're going to end up with a vector bundle. It's going to be a locally, a locally free sheaf. Well, in this degree range. So, in other words, um, if, I'm, if I'm looking at the uh, direct image of, of the dual of this universal bundle, which fiber-wise, again, over, over C, CDs, is exactly, is of the form O of D, um, then this is, this is locally free. Uh, and again, of rank, of rank given by the Riemann-Roch theorem, so just uh, d minus g plus 1. Okay. Well, so then the, the, the geometric fact that gets the Faber relation started is just that the churn classes of this bundle um, on, 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 on CD vanish past, uh, past the rank. Oh. 
So for i greater than d minus g plus 1, but in fact, for easy geometric reasons, one can see that you can strengthen it in this manner, for i greater than or equal to d minus g plus 1. Okay. So, but this is this is an equality in the in the chowering of uh, of the um, symmetric uh, symmetric product of the curve. Okay, so this is in a i of c b over m g. Okay. So so now let me let me call this map maybe epsilon. So how do we? So we'd like to calculate some push forwards of of this of this uh, trivial geometric identity to to m g, and so uh, so the way the way uh, the way Faber proceeded with this is that he in fact didn't work on the symmetric product of the curve, but rather he pushed back to the ordered product. So he considered a map which sends you know the product of the curve with itself d times into the symmetric product. Just take a collection of d points, map it to the divisor. Okay. And so now, if you if you pull back under this map, this churn class, this churn classes of of, the, of this tautological push forward, then you can really express them in classes which are very accessible. And what would those classes be? So what one has is for each. For each of the uh, factors in the product, one has a cotangent class. So there's a psi i on each factor, on, each, uh, on, the, i, uh, on the i's copy of c. And then there are, there are diagonal classes. You know? So one can look at, um, for example, um, so I. Um, there are diagonal classes delta ij, and so higher diagonal classes as well. And the calculus of these classes is well understood. I mean, these classes intersect in in in, in sort of straightforward way. So, for instance, you know, one has something like uh, delta one two squared is equal to minus i one delta one two, and so on. So, so once you express, once you you you. It's easy to express the churn classes in terms of in terms of this sort of uh, straightforward natural classes that, uh, on uh, on just the product of the curve with itself, the universal curve with itself, and then it's easy to to, to do this in principle, completely doable to just calculate the push forwards. So uh, so basically the the Faber relations are actually the following. So under this map eta, so one can do the following: you can take consider a monomial in in, in these uh, in psi classes or in diagonal classes, and and uh, further with this with these classes size or diagonal, so further cut the basic the basic va class that vanishes, and then. Um, And then just uh, push forward. So by this I mean the pullback, of course. By this, this I mean the pullback to the to the ordered product. And just this is zero. And now this is zero in the chowering of suitable uh, degree of mg. Okay. And here, of course, the condition is that uh, well, is this condition here on i. So now your calculations can be extremely explicit. But nonetheless, as the number of points increase, increases, so you consider these larger and larger these, just the complexity is, is tremendous. You get, I mean, so, so Faber, of course, has this uh, fantastic code that uh, allows him to, to sort of explicitly, uh, really, out, out of this, to uh, write this equation as a, as a polynomial equation in, in the Kappa classes. But, uh, it's a lot of work, although it's, it's in principle completely understood how you do it at every step, no? because you know the calculus of these classes very well. Ah, so that's so that's one. Um, and in fact, Faber's, con Faber's uh, original conjecture was that uh, these relations that he uh, um, so that, that are now on the board uh, actually 
uh, are all relations. I mean, it generate the idea of relations in, uh, uh, in, in the tautological ring. Okay. Yeah, well, so how would you push forward? I mean, the question is, you have a monomial in these guys. How would you push it forward? So you have something like this, you know, you want to push forward. Oh, so you, let's say, you know, you know, you have a power of psi 1, uh, and you have a power of psi 2, and then you have a diagonal class, let's say from C2 or something like that, no? Well, let's say this, you know. So, I mean, how do you do <laughs> How do you do it? I mean, then the diagonal class identifies these two. So then what you end up with here is kappa a plus b minus 1. Yeah? So that the diagonal class. So, so this is a push forward from C2. To so give an example. <laughs> so it's, kind of, yeah, it's kind of stupid, but that's, that's in general how you do it. You know? so. <laughs> right. Well, so, so another structure that one can consider over MG is the universal Picard variety. So uh, let's, um, so this is sort of a second line of uh, producing relations. Okay, so this is, um, this is the mo moduli space of degree zero line bundles. A smooth project over a smooth projecting curve of genus G. And so, in fact, you know, just um, it's, it's, it's simpler for some purposes to consider this, uh, uh, this over or MG1 rather than MG. So if I can consider I pull it back to MG1, then, then this J, which is actually J0, so I'm looking at degree zero line bundles, uh, then this is isomorphic to JD for any D because this point allows us to identify uh, line bundles. And moreover, this ensures that there is a, a Poincare line bundle on, 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 on J. There's a, some, there's a tautological structure here. Oh, uh, pardon? These moduli are closely related to the symmetric powers that you wrote. Oh, you mean the, the Picard variety? The Picard yeah. yeah, sure, sure. There's a map over MG1. There's a map from uh, the symmetric um, so, symmetric product of the Picard variety. So do you expect that this gives you like a superset of relations or a subset of relations? Well, there are interesting things that happen in the context of Jacobians themselves. So, so for instance, what happens is that you have a theta class. So precisely... In this setting, uh, there is a there is a class theta in the second cohomology of J. Um, right, so this uh, so this comes roughly from well over each over each fixed curve one has uh, one has the theta class which is just comes from the intersection form of the curve in uh, in 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 its in its Jacobian and. Of course, so the intersection form of the curve is actually monodromy invariant. So it will generate, as, as, you, as you move uh, over MG, as you sort of vary your curve, it will actually generate a global class in the cohomology of J. Okay, so um, I guess, so the, so you could say that um, this is characterized by the following properties if I wanted to. Well, number one, exactly that the restriction to the fibers of um, nu is the intersection form of the curve. And secondly, what is nu? Uh, nu is this, this uh, map which uh, uh, sends the universal Picard variety to, to MG. So the fibers of this, 
I mean, the fiber over a curve C is just the, the Jacobian of, of the curve C. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, well, and secondly, you know, there's a there's a zero section here. So this is an abelian uh, family of abelian varieties. So there's a zero section. Let's call it Z. So uh, this is normalized. This theta such that the pullback under Z is actually zero. This is this is a, cl a class one over mg, but rather over mg1. But it's sort of a technical thing. It doesn't doesn't matter much. So so the fact with this theta is that. Um, there is a line bundle, which has uh, this, which I, a determinant line bundle, which, which has this as, a, as, a, as its first turn class. So let me call it like this, a fat theta. This is a line bundle on J with C1 of this equal to theta. And moreover, it, it, is, it is known that if one pushes forward, powers of this line, sort of a, uh, a classical fact that if one pushes forward powers of this line bundle uh, via, via this map nu, well, one gets a vector bundle over mg, first of all, but moreover that vector bundle is projectively flat. Okay, so here one gets, there, there is no higher cohomology just because the theta line bundle over each individual Jacobian doesn't have higher cohomology. So this is a vector bundle and moreover it's it a, has a projectively flat structure. So then there are, you know, the, the churn classes obviously are constrained thereby. And so at the end of the day, oh, so this is, this is the vector bundle. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, the relationship that one gets is that, in fact, the push forward, so this, this fact implies after, you know, some bit of algebra that um, the push forward of powers of the, of the, of the theta class uh, vanish past uh, uh, degree uh, g. So this is zero for i greater than or for i greater than zero. On mg again. Okay. In fact, on mg one, in the way I wrote it. Okay. But even something even stronger holds. In fact, which um, which is an observation, I guess, of Morita. <laughs> and uh, Oscar Randall Williams. And this observation is that even before you push forward, uh, higher powers of, of, of the theta class, I mean past G, that is, uh, do vanish. So, so you've got this vanishing already. Um, so theta G plus 1 is equal to 0. In, and this is, this is something that holds in cohomology, though. So one, you know, it's sort of a. Uh, so this is of, in the cohomology of the of the Picard variety. Two, I'm sorry, two G plus two. Okay. okay. So then, so then again, one generates relations by pushing forward this multiplied by suitable classes on um, on J. So one pushes. This forward, so there's this whole system of relation, again by um, pushing forward some some monomial in in natural classes on J times this. This is equal to zero in the cohomology um, of mg. Okay. It's another it's another way of uh, generating relations. Okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 at the end I want to comment on this. I mean, this is exactly the point in some sense. Um, yeah, one doesn't get new relations in this manner. No, but, uh, well, so. Yeah. 
this theta divides here is just like what is it? Like like diagonal of one, two, three. Do you think it's the fact that C to the C minus one going to C G inside of the Jacobian is actually the theta divisor, right? Is that that's why you don't get new relations? No, no, it's, it's absolutely not obvious that you don't get new relations. <laughs> okay. So we can, you can't just think about it for a second and say, well, you, know, you don't get new relations in this way. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different equation, and it comes from different considerations, different geometry. So, yeah. It's a different oh, can I? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so, it, um, does it have something to do with the cohomology of uh, the symplectic group? I mean, you have a map on the mapping terms of the symplectic group. Which is the one that it's yeah, it, it comes from the fact that um, exactly the well, exactly. If you look at the local system, the R one local system of uh, over of the curve over over M, over M G, yeah, that you know that's it's, it has flatness, no. So in the end, I mean that's that's what this this means, you know. So yeah. So in other words, locally, you see, locally, if you write. If you write this theta in coordinates over, you know, over an open subset of Mg, um, then it, you, really, you really write it only in terms of the fiber coordinates you see on the Jacobian. So it's... Well, yeah. I'm kind of the same translating my mind what all this means in, the, in terms of the mapping class group. No, and yeah. see if it comes from this. Okay. So. Okay. Well, so maybe we can, yeah, we can talk. I don't, I, I don't know offhand, so... Well, so, so here is... Um, so basically, you see, I just want to convince you that the way to, I mean, the way people have thought about this historically is you consider some, um, some natural structure associated to MG. You generate, you have some geometry there, and you push forward some sort of natural geometric identities to MG, and that generates these relations among kappa classes. And you know, it can get more involved. So for instance, my third proposal. So what have we considered so far? Just the, first of all, the universal curve itself. Then we consider the symmetric power of the universal curve. Then the Picard variety. And now I'm going to propose something else to you. And this is a, this is a Grodin de Quote scheme over Mg. So here is what it is for a fixed curve. I have this space, which I'm going to denote in this manner. Well, so let me. So what this parameterizes is, exa is a exact sequences on the curve of the following form. You have a line bundle mapping into a, injectively into a um, rank R plus one trivial sheaf, and then there's some quotient associated with this. And the line bundle has degree minus D. So this is on, on a curve C. So this is, uh, this is what, uh, this is a very, very sort of a particular case of a Grodin de quote scheme. So of course, this in the symmetric, um, the symmetric product is just the case when uh, this r is equal to zero. You no, know? then you have exact sequences, line bundles mapping into just just a copy of all. So again, one can consider this structure uh, over as you let the curve vary in moduli. So you have a you have a. Um, I'm going to denote this qg. So you let the curve vary in moduli, and you get the space over, over mg. Um, and so let's call this map q. Um, and so I'm, I'm only going to look at the, sort of the next level of uh, um, sophistication here, past what we've already discussed, nearly when r is equal to 1. So I'm just going to look at, look at maps of line bundles into, into, into a trivial rank two sheaf. And so even in this case, there is a, in particular, there is a universal structure um, here. So um, as, in, as in all cases that we've discussed, so there's a universal exact sequence. Um, well, let me do it like this. So and this, this is, this is on this space QG over MG. Um, so again, it has a tautological property that if you pick out one curve and one exact sequence on, on this curve and you specialize this, you restrict this universal sequence, you get that particular um, uh, point in the space that you're, you're uh, 
uh, you're restricting to. So here we're going to do something even more radical than um, uh, more radical than what we've been doing so far, which is kind of reasonable classical geometry. Um, namely, we're going to push forward just zero, literally. So, um, so I want to calculate is q star of zero to some power. And this zero I view as the first churn class. So I'm, I'm thinking of zero as the first churn class of a trivial line bundle on this space qg. Okay. Oh, on qg. Okay, so obviously we're going to add zero. Now I'm going to push this forward. But so the point is that this space, it's just a bit more complicated than what we've been talking about before. In particular, it has a symmetry. So the, the, the linear group, uh, the general linear group, G, GLR plus 1, acts, acts here on the, on the, on the uh, middle term. So then it acts also consequently on the whole space. And so I'm, if you consider just a, a subgroup of that, a small subgroup, in fact, just a torus, a C star, uh, this will, you, you, there, will be some, there will be some action some symmetry on, on, on the space. And I'm considering the simplest instance of this. And let's say that C star acts on. So again, you know, I'm looking at this space really when, when R is equal to 1. So C star acts on just a two-dimensional vector space um, you know, with diagonal weights, let's say 0 and 1. Okay. And so then what, what, I, what I'm going to do is that I'm, I'm going to make this, um, so I'm looking at a trivial line bundle, but equivariantly I'm going to make it non-trivial. So you're making it equivariantly non-trivial. In fact, you wandered over the fixed loci. Um, uh, the, the weight on, uh, on the fibers is actually 1, let's say. So, so we're lifting this trivial vector bundle to a non-trivial non equivariant line, bund line bundle with respect to C star. And so, so then, in, so when formally localizing this class 0, using equivariant localization on this space, and let's see what the fixed loci are. Well, so if you have, so it's, you know, in order for, a, for an exact sequence like that to be fixed under the action of this group, you either have to map the line bundle into the first copy of C, sort of the first eigen, um, eigen line of, of this C star action on, on O2. So you either ha have this mapping here. And this is one possibility. Or you have to map it into the other. No, this, there is not, nothing else that can, can go on here. In order, to, in order for this to be fixed, we're talking about fixed points under this action on, on this space QG. Okay. So, so here, oh, so you, you either have this or this. So in either case, what do you get? Well, you get the setup we talked about before. L mapping into O is just a symmetric product. Of, um, of, the, of the universal curve, of the curve, and you know, doing it over MG of the universal curve. So you've got two fixed loci, and either this or this, and they're both isomorphic to, uh, to, the, to the symmetric product of the curve. But so now when you, when you localize, one, one gets equivariantly a, a non, what's a, a, a non-zero non class on, on CD, what looks like a non-zero class. I mean, so what, what, what appears in the equivariant localization is the Euler class of the normal bundle. Well, this equivariantly will, will not be zero. So the end result is that one gets, for example, the following relation. So if we mm -hmm. 
I want to get to the push forward. So I start with something that I know for sure pushes forward to zero. So what I conclude, so this map, remember, we called epsilon, the map from the symmetric product to mg. Um, so one gets that the push forward of a, of, a, of a class, which is not obviously zero, uh, <coughs> will, will be zero in mg. And this class is a, is a turn class of, in fact, the push forward of this universal bundle. So anyway, the, the exact, uh, well, the, what? The exact form of this is not, is not super interesting. Um, I'm going to write it anyway for completeness. Equal to zero. And here, in fact, I'm taking this A to be an even number. Okay. That's the that's required for this. Okay. So it's just something that uh, you start with zero, and you know what you get is zero. but when you push, the, push this forward, and now again you're in this, we're in this setup with, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, when we have the symmetric power of the curve, where we can calculate in principle, um, sort of there's an explicit calculus in principle, uh, then one gets this relation, which is not the same as the Faber relations. Well, but so where does this end now? I mean, because you... Does one, get it, does one get anything new in this manner? So you can think of various geometric constructions. And in the end, so this in particular, this last one is, uh, is a relation written in a paper joint with uh, Drago Chopra and Rahul from the Ripande. We sort of study the geometry of these spaces over MG and so uh, of these quote, quote spaces. So in particular, there are consequences like this. But so, um, so here is the sort of the, <laughs> the most comprehensive statement um, that in the end, we, after you know, sort of considerable after considerable effort, um, uh, Rahul Pandaripande, together with his student um, uh, Aaron Pixton, managed to show. So this is a. So the, sort of the, the nicest, the most compelling form of, of, of any relationship, of, of any relation written in the topological ring of, of, of MG. So one, one has to consider the following. So it's a bit involved, but I'll, I'll write it on the, on the board. Um, and I'll describe the result. So we're going to consider an infinite set of variables. OK, and um, we're going to denote, denote them like this. So they're, they're indexed by, by positive integers which, were, which are not equal to 2 mod 3. So, and so on. So it's an infinite set of variables indexed by positive integers um, which are not 2 mod 3. Okay. And um, so, so then I'm going to consider the, the following formal series in, in, in these variables p and one variable t. So here it is, here this is. So the following series in t appears. So it's actually a very nice, it may seem a bit complicated, but it's actually a the result of many efforts to bring it to this form. Um, so it's the same series slightly modified. So it has two, two very distinct series in its components. So this is a formal series in uh, these variables p, and there's a, this is variable t. And so we're gonna, now we're going to define, so this is a purely algebraic statement. Mm -hmm. 
So one takes the, so we're going we're gonna to talk, so, we're, so here in, in the following, sigma will be a partition um, which, avoids, which avoids all integers which are, which are equal to 2 mod 3. So for instance, I mean all parts. And so all the parts in the partition are not integers equal to um, 2 mod 3. Okay? So in our words, in you know, standard writing, so sigma I could think of it as something like this. So you can have 1 appearing you know, a number of times. Then I can have 3 appearing a number of times. 4 appearing and so on. But not the, I can have parts which are equal to 2 mod 3. So then I can associate it to this, I consider the monomial, if you want to do a partition like this. Um, and so on. Okay. So now I define the following number, um, which depends on, on um, some, some integer and also on this on a partition as the coefficient in the series of this, in the log of this formal series. So I've got this formal series. You take its logarithm. And is this, is this is all of these, is all of finitely many of, are all but finitely many of these zero, or is this? No, these are finite uh, objects, so these like partitions. They're all yeah. finite. Oh, yeah. okay, 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 sorry. Yeah, well, it can continue. I'm just giving, yeah, I mean. And the can be zero. Yeah, of but course, this is not of course. Uncountable. This is not like a subset of z hat. This is not like an uncountable set. It's not even count. I mean, it's it's finite, you know. I could part. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. Sorry. So, okay, it's, it's it's good to be precise here. So, so you know, so you, you put together this this formal series. You take its logarithm, <laughs> and you write it as a sum over partitions, and this um, additional integer r of well. You're, you're picking out what powers of t with r, and then the partitions in index um, various powers of this variable p. No, so this this is this is always going to be writable like this. No, and uh, so th th this is what the numbers c r sigma r, and now so I'm we're putting back together. We're getting a class in in the tautological ring by taking this sum and inserting kappa classes. So we're doing this, um, we're, we have a kappa r, t to the r, t sigma. Okay, so by now, so now we have a series which involves these kappa classes. What we're going to do next is exponentiate this series. Exponentiate this series and, uh, and the relation then these are called, so these, what one gets is equations which were conjectured by Faber and Zagier based, based early on empirical evidence. So here they are. So they were proved by uh, Rahul Tondaritani and his student. So if you exponentiate this series and you're looking at the coefficient of d to the r, P sigma, well, this is zero uh, whenever, well, so there are some conditions here. Um, G minus one plus the size of the partition is less than three R, and there's a congruence condition on the genus, should be congruent to R plus sigma plus one mod two. Okay? It's sort of a clean formulation. You may think it's sort of a and kind of an interesting series that you uh, you construct, and then you 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 know you uh, put it together with the kappa classes, and so so then this is this sort of a clean uh, clean expression, and now the what what uh, um, Rahul and uh, Aaron Pixton managed to do was to show that. This set of relations is completely equivalent to the relations that one gets. 
that one gets from the geometry of this code scheme that we were talking about before. And in particular, all these include all known relations. Yeah, so this, these faber zagier relations, um, so, all, so basically all studied relations are among these. Okay. All studied and understood, no relations, are among these. But so, how does this leave us as far as this Gorenstein conjecture? Well, so, uh, so Karl Faber showed that up to genus 23, these relations, there are sufficiently many relations generated in this manner by, by this equation. Uh, to, to ensure that, uh, that the tautological ring is Gorenstein. Okay. Be Gorenstein. Okay. However, in genus 24, this is not enough. When genus, when genus, the genus is 24, if one looks in particular at the degree 12 um, uh, uh, tautological uh, chow, so I mean here you've, you've got 40, 40 re independent relations coming out of these, of the, the, the faber zagier relations. But in fact, 41 are needed to, to prove the Gorenstein property. Yeah, so, so one needs 41. Um, so, this, so this raises some interesting questions. Now, at this point, you have to sort of make up your mind what, what, you, know, what you believe. So all, all relations that people studied and generated from, from all these geometric constructions, in the end, by sort of a, a really a tour de force here by, by, uh, by Pandaripan and his collaborator, were shown to amount to this one, which sort of has a completely algebraic statement, which I, which I, which I described. But so then, you know, uh, one, one may be tempted to assume that these are, these are all the relations. I mean, uh, in, the, in the tautological uh, chow of uh, the tautological ring of MG. But then so here, here this, nonetheless, I mean, it's clear in genus 24 that um, you, don't, you don't have sufficiently many to ensure the Gorenstein property. So either you believe that or you believe that there are some relations out there that are not captured by this. So, um, and so one idea, if, one, you, know, if you wanna sort of try, try to produce some really novel, novel relations, is to, is to look at um, structures over MG which, which are not sort of rank one, rank one phenomena. Like for instance, the universal Picard variety we study line bundles over, over curves with um, you know, the symmetric product of a curve. It's the same idea. But one can look, for instance, at the moduli space of rank two vector bundles over, over a curve as, as the curve varies in, in moduli. And there are some, some interesting geometries completely uh, specific, specific to, that, um, uh, to, 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 this, to this moduli space, which is not a sort of a rank one phenomenon. And by that I mean, for instance, there's a projective flatness of the Hitchin connection that appears in that case, which has to be reflected in the, you know, in the, in, in the cohomology of MG you see there. I mean, you have a vector bundle over MG um, uh, studied, by, studied by Hitchin, which is projectively flat. Would that, and it's absolutely not a rank one phenomenon, would that give a, a missing, missing relation? It's, it's not clear, so sort of a... Uh, I guess it's it's work in progress to some extent. So, um, so yeah. Well, I guess I'll stop here. Right, it's a bit, I went a bit over. Sorry. Are there questions? There were a lot of questions during the talk, but are there more now? Oh, sorry. What is the? I mean, what is this Gordon saying conjecture all about? What, what does it practically mean? Why why does one conjecture it? Well, so it was conjectured, as I said, sort of based on empirical evidence in lower genera. So at the time um, the conjecture was formulated, Karl Faber, by Karl Faber, 
he had checked it, I believe, up to genus 15 or so. I mean, you sort of start to believe it. I mean, you, you know, I mean. And is this just a numer numerical criterion on the number of relations in each degree, or is it? Well, it's. it's uh, well, it's a I mean, how many relations you have, and no, I think it's. It's more intricate. So yeah, it's 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 an intricate structure. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it's not just additive. You don't just look at the petty numbers. No, no, <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. Yeah. So um, and and so so I guess. Why well, you know? I mean, it's like a tremendous effort by Carver to work on this problem. So. But, but just to follow up then, in genus up to 23, it's, there are sufficient many relations to get the correct uh, Hilbert series for this uh, range. But do you actually show that? Yeah, they show that actually for the Gorenstein range. But that's further work. It doesn't yeah, fall from the yeah. genetics. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Is there any physics version in the background? <laughs> 24 is a pretty special number. <laughs> yeah, <that's very> <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. Have people been able to use the genus values for which the conjecture is known to be true to use the conjecture, the proven conjecture, to do something? Pardon? Well, what's the, what's the consequence of the conjecture being true? Well, it's it's understanding the moduli space of curves. It's sort of a fundamental yeah. geometric object. I mean, you, know, yeah, you, you don't have access. But what, were you, what, were you what, are the, what are the consequences that would follow from it, do you think? I mean, practical consequence for our everyday life. I mean, no, no. <laughs> no, no. I'm thinking, right? <laughs> no. if, I, if I were a moduli of curves, the consequences. I mean, can I ask a different question? No. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. So I, I don't. I mean, I don't have. I mean, I. Yeah, one, so, so yeah, just to finish, I, you know, I, one would like to understand really the cohomology of MG, you know, I mean, but that's sort of, it seems like an unattainable goal. For instance, there's odd cohomology. And so then, you know, okay, we're looking at the Chow ring, but even there we can, there are classes which are not tautological. How, how does one get a grasp of them? No, you can't. So, but at least with these one, one would hope to understand the structure there. And so, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Compactify modular space. Anything you can say about that? Yeah, there are. So, so yeah, I just wanted to to formulate things for uh, for for MG, but um, um, you know, one one can look at various compactify to various degrees. One can look at curves of compact type, and one can look at stable curves, the Lin Mumford stable curves. One can look at points with marked uh, at curves with marked points. So, uh, s some versions of the Faber conjectures have been formulated for for all of these cases. And part uh, part of them were proven, m m mostly related to generations and generation by by sort of small degree kappa classes and, and independence of those. But but uh, I think this uh, this Gorenstein property is sort of open in, in any but formulation. Does the information travel back and forth between mg and mg bar? Or what that, I mean, in terms of applications, I mean, yeah. does it say something about the compactification? Well, I mean, yeah, it's true. Part of the so so rather it's kind of went the other way. So information about uh, the fact that, for instance, a part of the intersection theory of the of the moduli spaces M G and bar. Is, is, well, is, is, is understood by the Witten conjectures, helped in you know, establishing parts of, you know, parts of Faber's uh, sort of tower of conjecture. So, I mean, there was information from MG derived, about MG derived from you know, the intersection theory of MG bar or MG and bar. So that's in this direction, surely, you know, there, there has been, uh, there have been implications for sure, the cohomology of MG. Are there any more questions? So I seem to recall the whole constructed some non tautological classes in N24. Like no yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, has it been checked how those pair against this extra piece? Um, I mean, you know, one way of checking it's not zero, it's hit with a bunch of stuff, and when you get to. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that has been checked. Yeah. I, in fact, I doubt it. I see. But, yeah.
It's a good point. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Alina again. And, uh,